What's up guys, welcome to the Test Giant. This is Solomon Riddell, and in today's video, I'm gonna be showing out one of the most famous and honestly one of the most popular options for black against the move E4 with the French defense and specifically how to fight against the advanced variation in which white plays D4 and against D5 continues to push down the center of the board with e5 and really this move does make a ton of sense in terms of chess opening strategy for white now by playing e5 white does get a pretty good edge in space right in the center of the board and on top of that our quote unquote french bishop on c8 is very locked in to the pawn on b7 and especially this pawn on e6. This minor piece is probably not going to be the most active, at least for the next five to 10 moves. However, I do believe that black has great counterattacking chances fighting for both the center of the board and the queen side in this position, we cannot afford to play passive chess. We can't play moves like bishop e7, knight d7, fee and shadowing our bishop. If we do this, white is simply going to steamroll us. We need to fight for the center of the board right away. And in this particular variation against e5, we need to attack this pawn on d4 as much as possible. If this pawn on d4 falls, so will the pawn on e5. So we're going to start off by playing c5. And here the only move that really does give white... A fighting chance is c3, trying to keep this pawn chain together. Again, once one of these fall, the pawn on e5 is going to fall as well. So white needs to try to hold this pawn chain together. Against this, we're going to continue to put more pressure on that centralized pawn by playing knight c6. And really, no matter what white plays, let's say a move like knight f3, we're now going to play queen b6, putting even more pressure on that pawn on d4 and also putting a little bit of pressure on that pawn on b2 making this dark squared bishop a prisoner now in this position there's really three main moves or ideas for white the first is what happens if white just plays a quiet developmental move like bishop e2 simply looking to castle kingside we're going to cover bishop e2 first we're then going to cover the milner berry gambit with bishop d3 and lastly we're going to cover a3 the most popular option at the master and grandmaster level let's first cover the move bishop e2 now as i mentioned we're trying to put as much pressure as possible on that pawn on d4 we've already had a pawn knight and queen ganging up on that pawn what other pieces can we use here well the answer is this knight on g8 bringing our knight to f5 now there's two ways to do this we can play knight h6 or we can play knight g e7 but ironically i actually don't think that this is the best way for black to play because now white can take the pawn on c5 and as y'all can see this bishop because of the knight can no longer take that pawn we're going to have to take back with the queen in which case white can play moves like b4 kicking the queen to b6 b5 attacking the knight bishop e3 attacking the queen again we simply don't want to do this this is going to give white too big of an attacking edge on the queen side of the board so instead of knight g e7, we're actually going to play knight h6, wanting to bring our knight to f5. And we're going to cover what happens if white just plays a move like castle and kingside. But let's first cover the obvious question. I mean, why doesn't white just take the knight on h6? This is actually not a bad move for white, in which case we're now going to take back with this pawn. And I know usually, I mean, we don't want to have double isolated pawns on the h file at move 7 in the game. But in this particular instance, I actually think that black has proven itself to have a very nice game. Really, the whole reason is that this bishop was a dark squared bishop defending the pawn on b2, which was really holding this pawn chain together. Right now, we're putting a ton of pressure on d4 and b2, and really the only way for white to defend both the best is through the move queen d2, defending that pawn on b2 and defending the pawn on d4. Against this, we can just naturally develop with moves like bishop d7, bishop g7, and as y'all can notice, because of this queen trying to hold this pawn chain together, this knight on b1 can't really naturally develop to d2 or c3. So you're probably going to see a move like knight a3, in which case, now that the knight is on the edge of the board, we can take that pawn on d4. And the very next move, play something like castle and kingside. I usually don't recommend you castle kingside, especially when you have double isolated pawns on the h file. But in this particular instance, I think that is actually the best plan for black. There's really no attacking chances white has here if we play this correctly. The move you're probably going to see is knight c2, the best option for white. The whole purpose of this is really two-sided. White could first off support a b4 push and on top of that could play knight e3 followed by knight g4 attacking that pawn 
on h6. We need to undermine this center right away or else we're going to be in big, big trouble. We need to play f6 right now using our bishop, pawn, and knight, all gaining up on that e5 pawn. Here, white will probably take that pawn on f6, white's best move, in which case we can now take with the rook. And following this knight e3 idea, we can form a battery ram on the f-file with both of our rooks. And now the move knight g4 may seem a little bit intimidating. I mean, this knight is attacking our pawn on h6, it's attacking our rook on f6, and this square on e5, but because of the fact that we played f6 and wasted no time in bringing our other rook to f8, giving this rook on f6 some support, we can now play the key idea of rook f4 attacking the knight and again this pawn on d4 i mean look at this position we have a rook bishop knight and queen pretty much every piece possible attacking that isolated pawn now right now knight ge5 is more or less forced in which case we're going to take that knight and the very next move i mean our only bad piece here is the bishop on d7 it's not doing a ton and in chess we always want to try to improve the positioning of our pieces so here we can play a move like bishop e8 the very next move bring our bishop to g6 and if you just look at the activity of black's pieces in that position i would pick black every single time not to mention that we have a supported pass pawn on d5 so that covers what happens if bishop takes h6 is played. We're simply going to take that bishop back, continue with natural developmental chess like bishop d7, bishop g7, and whenever knight a3 is played, we can take that pawn on d4. We're going to throw castling in there, and we're just playing chess. Now what if white decides not to give up the bishop pair and instead just castles kingside? Well, I actually think that this is even better for black. We're going to take that pawn on d4 and then continue with knight f5. Now both of our knights and our queen, again, are putting a ton of pressure on that d4 pawn. And really the only way to defend it is by playing bishop e3. But now the pawn on b2 hangs and following the move knight bd2, we can continue by taking the bishop on e3, playing queen a3, attacking that pawn. And now if queen b3, which is more or less forced because white does not want to go down two pawns, we could take that queen off the board. And if knight takes b3 is played, continue with bishop a3. A key move stopping a rook from coming to c1. White would love to bring a rook to this open file. So by playing bishop a3, we are prohibiting white from doing that. And on top of that, stopping this a pawn from making any space on the queen side of the board. In this position, we're simply up a pawn and white doesn't have anything to show for it. So that covers the move bishop e2 in which case we're going to play knight h6, wanting to bring our knight to f5. I absolutely love that variation for black. What do we do against bishop d3 with the Milner Barry Gambit? A lot of French defense players actually fall into trouble against the Barry Gambit. However, if well prepared, I actually think that black is simply better. Now, what a lot of players do is they take the pawn on d4, which, by the way, is the correct move, but following c takes d4, take the bait. I mean, in this position, it may seem, at least at first sight, that because of our two attacking pieces and only the one defender, we can win a pawn. But the truth is, is that following knight takes d4 and queen takes d4, we're only up a pawn for about five seconds because of bishop b5 check attacking our king, and our queen is about to fall the very next move. This is completely losing for black. So again, keep in mind against the Milner Barry Gambit, you can take that pawn on d4, but following c takes d4, do not take the bait, and instead play bishop d7, by far black's best move. And now we're actually threatening to take this pawn because there's no longer any possible checks against our king. I mean, if we take this pawn and knight takes back and queen takes back, there's really no way for this bishop to play bishop b5 or bishop g6 and attack our king. So right now we are actually threatening to win that pawn and there's really no good way for white to defend it i mean if bishop e3 is played well we simply just take the pawn on b2 and if a move like bishop c2 is played this may seem very strong because both bishops on c1 and c2 are very active here and the queen now can defend that pawn on d4 but we now have the key idea of knight b4. I really do think that you should memorize this move because really any other move for black I think gives white a clear advantage because a3 could be played the very next move defending that square in which case I mean white just has a huge attacking edge on the king side of the board but if we play knight b4 right away we are attacking 
that bishop on c2. If we move like castling kingside, we can capture that bishop, continue with rook c8, knight e7, knight c6, attacking that pawn on d4. I mean, we're just playing natural chess there. And if a move like bishop b3, trying to hold on to the bishop, well, we now have queen a6, slicing down to that f1 square, not allowing white to castle. And if a move like queen e2 is played, trying to contest that diagonal, we can now play bishop b5, forming a battery ram on the a6 f1 diagonal, attacking that queen. Knight d3 check is coming soon, and black is simply winning this game. So against the move bishop d7, it's probably in white's best interest to not even try and defend that pawn on d4 and instead just castle kingside, in which case we're now going to take the pawn and following knight takes d4, take back with our queen. Here, the main line is knight c3, in which case we're going to play a6. Always a good idea to play a move like a6, not allowing any kind of potential knight b5 or bishop b5 ideas in this game. And following the move, queen e2, naturally developing the queen and defending that pawn on e5. We can now play knight e7, followed by knight c6. Really, our whole idea here is getting our knight on g8 involved. A very common theme in the French defense. Play knight e7, knight c6, and as y'all can see, following the move f4, even knight b4 can be played both the knight and the queen attacking that bishop on d3 now here probably the best move for white is rook d1 defending that bishop and also trying to form some tactics with bishop b5 or bishop takes a6 but in this position there is no reason for black to be afraid and play a move like queen b6 because in that case white could simply play a bishop e3 at some point kicking our queen and white's going to have some pretty good activity i think here we need to play the move bishop c5 really eyeing that g1 square and i'm not gonna lie this variation this line this position is absolutely crazy it does take some work but i'm really gonna try to explain this position to you guys right now i mean really what we're trying to do is take this bishop on d3 in which case i mean if rook takes d3 we simply have a mate in one right on g1 so the queen would have to take back in which case we can simply take the queen and go into the end game upon ahead and white doesn't want to do this white right now is down a pawn and therefore needs to try to complicate this position the move you're probably going to see the most is bishop takes a6 evening out the material and attacking our queen on d1 now the key move because of bishop c5 is queen f2 and really in this position there's two main moves for white the first being bishop b5 and the second being queen takes f2 but let's cover the question of what happens if white just takes the pawn on b7 i mean why can't white just go upon a head here well the reason that this doesn't work is because we can take the queen on e2 and then play rook a7. And as y'all can see, this bishop on b7 is trapped. It can't get out, and we're about to win a piece. So bishop takes b7 doesn't work because we simply win the piece. What about the move bishop b5 attacking our bishop on d7? Well, now if we take the bishop on b5, white could take back checking our king and attacking that pawn on b7. So we don't want to take this bishop. Instead, we're going to trade down by taking the queen. And I mean, here, if the knight takes, we simply take the bishop on b5. So here, white will probably just take our queen with the bishop, in which case we can now castle kingside. And following the move a3, play knight c2, attacking that rook. If rook b1, play bishop c6, really trying to solidify the positioning of our pieces. And if a move like bishop d3, attacking our knight on c2, we can now play knight e3, attacking that rook on d1. I think the best move here for white is probably just taking that knight off the board. I mean, that's a very active knight and not the best bishop on c1. So here, if bishop takes e3 is played, we can now take back. And yes, white did give up a bad piece for a good piece. But in return, we get a very active bishop pair currently attacking that pawn on f4 and this is a very difficult position to play with as the white pieces i mean on top of that we have a supported pass pawn on d5 which is very solid right now i think the best move is probably a move like rook f1 in which case we can simply continue with g6 rook fc8 we're just playing chess and i would pick black every single time there but let's say white plays a move like g3 well, now the game is simply over. We play d4 with check, attacking this king. I mean, this king is literally almost checkmated. And following the move knight e4, which is more or less forced, we can play f6 with the idea of playing f5 next, attacking that pinned knight on e4. And there's really no way for white to get out of this. This is a resignable position for the white pieces.
So that covers bishop b5. We're going to take that queen on e2, continue to castle, bring our rook to c8, and we're just playing chess. And if a move like a3 is ever played, we can play knight c2, knight e3, and have some fun with that knight. What happens if white takes our queen on f2? Well, now we're simply going to take back with the bishop. And again, if white takes this pawn on b7, we simply play rook a7, and we're about to win a piece. So what happens if white plays a move like bishop b5? Well, now we can play bishop c6, and if the move a3 is played, we could actually castle kingside, because if white takes our knight, well, we simply win the rook on a1. Here, if white plays a move like bishop takes c6, we can take back with our b pawn supporting our pawn, our pass pawn on d5 even further with our pawns on e6 and c6. And if a move like rook b1, well, now our knight is actually threatened on b4 because this rook is out of the way. So we can play a move like knight a6 and following b4, play rook f b8. This actually reminds me of a reverse Banco Gambit type system. Both of our rooks are very active, piercing down on the a and b files. I mean, if a move like g3, we can play the idea of bishop b6 followed by the very next move c5. And some of you may be wondering, I mean, why would we ever play this? I mean, white could play something like b5 and following knight c7, white has passed pawns, but we have passed pawns as well on d5 and c5. And honestly, I think that we have a better grip, especially on the dark squares of b6 and a5 as both our bishop and our rook defend that square. We're going to continue by playing moves like c4, d4 attacking that knight, c3 threatening c2 attacking both rooks. We're just playing chess. This is nearly losing for white. If you plug this into a computer program, it's going to pick black every time. So we just covered the milner Barry gambit in which white plays bishop d3, in which case we're going to take that pawn on d4 and following c takes d4, not take the bait, but play bishop d7 and then take the pawn if allowed the very next move. In fact, if white does defend that pawn, I think black is that much better for it. What about the move a3, which by the way is the most popular option as I mentioned at the master and grandmaster level. The move I recommend is c4 and this is really an interesting position in my opinion. I mean, we as black have a very strong pawn chain from f7 all the way down to c4 and white as well has a very strong pawn chain from b2 all the way to e5. There's a give and take here, advantages and disadvantages with both sides. I think that white does have an advantage on the king side of the board, and we as black have an advantage on the queen side of the board. Here, following a move like knight bd2, we're going to play knight a5. We're trying to get a grip on the b3 square as much as possible. We're really trying to control for the rest of this game b3 and a4, because if we can control both of these squares, we're going to own the queen side of the board. Now we're going to cover the move bishop e2, but what happens if white plays rook b1 with the idea of breaking through with b3? I mean, here we're going to play the very key move bishop d7. You will see why in just a second. If white plays b3 here, we're going to take that pawn and following knight takes b3, it may seem as if white is breaking open this position and that it's good for white. But now we have the key move, bishop a4, pinning that knight on b3 to the queen on d1. If knight takes a5 is played, we could take that knight back with our queen. And if a move like knight fd2, we can play rook c8. And it goes without saying, I mean, look at the activity of our pieces here. Our minor pieces on a4 and a5 are putting a ton of pressure on that knight, as well as our queen on b6. Our bishop on f8, which hasn't even moved yet, is attacking a3. And we have a very nice rook on c8. I would pick black every single time here. And I also think that this is a very uncomfortable position to play with as the white pieces. So again, following the move knight a5, it's really not the best idea for white to play a move like rook b1 trying to break through with b3. Because we have this bishop d7 followed by bishop a4 idea. What happens if white plays a quiet move like bishop e2? Now, again, we're trying to activate this knight. And in some previous lines that we just covered, we wanted to put our knight on f5. But the reason was is because we took this pawn on d4 and the pawn was very vulnerable to attack. But in this position, I mean, what would a knight on f5 even be doing? We're not going to take the pawn because, well, we would just lose our knight. Instead, we're going to try to get our knight to the square of b6. What on earth am I talking about? Well, we want to bring our knight to e7 to c8 to b6, and eventually to a4, attacking that pawn on b2. We can bring the knight to a4, or we could use this knight to support the bishop 
coming in 2A4. We're trying to get as many of our pieces as we can on this side of the board so that we can get the best attacking chances possible and really go after this pawn on B2, which by the way is holding this entire pawn chain all the way down to E5. Now, in order to do this, playing knight e7, bishop c8, and queen b6, there's a couple pieces that need to get out of the way. Here we're going to play bishop d7, eyeing that a4 square, and following castling kingside, we're now going to see our knight maneuver with knight e7, continued by queen c7, and now we're going to play knight c8, knight b6, and if a move like bishop f4, we can play h6, not allowing any bishop g5 or knight g5 ideas for the rest of this game. And following h4, I really do think that this is a key idea, especially when playing c4 against this main a3 move. We need to castle queenside. If we castle kingside here, guys, we're actually in pretty big trouble. We as black have all of our pieces on the queen side of the board, and it's going to be very difficult for us to get these pieces back to defend our king. White on the other hand, has a ton of space and attacking pressure on the king side of the board. I mean, if we castled king side, white could play moves like queen d2, capture on h6, and then following queen takes h6, play knight g5. White could also play moves like g4 and g5 right away, knight g3, and knight h5 attacking both g7 and f6. This is simply not good news for black. Instead, we need to castle queen side, and now I actually really like black's game. We're going to continue with a move like bishop a4, attacking that queen on d1, throw our knight into b3, and we're just playing chess. If you'd like to learn more on the theory behind the French defense as a whole, click the video to the left. If you'd like to learn more about the hippopotamus defense, a very fun and strong chess opening for black, click the video to the right. Leave a comment to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.